Good morning. Someone once said the holiest moment on a Sunday is when the Christians leave the building. And so it came to pass that Christians have left the building. On Tuesday night, we met as a leadership to discuss the way forward. And the one message that came out was very clear was this, God is not in a panic. I don't know if you remember, but three weeks ago, um, the American preacher, David Hinman, preached in the morning service and he said this, God is on the move and there's an invitation for us to join him. So in the midst of this new crisis, there will be many opportunities for us as people of hope to embrace and to influence the lives of those around us. So may this, this new way of doing church will be an encouragement for us, an excitement. Let's be the church. This morning I want to share with you, and if I can call the, my message, the value of your own story. Now as followers of, of Jesus, we are on a mission. And the mission is, as I understand it, is threefold. First of all, to be a disciple of Jesus. John 8 verse 31 says this, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Another translation says this, If you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. Secondly, we are to be disciple makers. And that speaks for itself. We know what the Great Commission is all about. And thirdly, it is this, to promote his name, his kingdom, and his will, which means no longer my name. It's no longer my little kingdom. It's no longer my will. But this mission comes with a message. And if I can quote David Hinman again, who said this, it was quite profound. I never thought of it before, but it sounds just, that's how it's supposed to be. The Great Commission and the Great Commandment goes hand in hand. And this message, this message that we preach, the message that we take out is this message of love. God is the Father of love. So first of all, love of God, our Father, love of our true self, and love of others. So we're on a mission. We've got a message. Now we need a method. I'm going to go to Acts 1. Verse 8, and it says here, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. I.e., the disciples will go out and tell their stories, their first-hand experiences of Jesus. The method is storytelling. Each disciple then had his or her own story, and so we have our own story too. And we get to be his witness in our story. In that verse in Acts, there's also a promise. It says, we shall receive power because the Holy Spirit is within us. So we are not alone. Okay, so I have my story. Check. I want to be a witness for Christ. Check. Now what? WWJD. What would Jesus do? But look at how Jesus um, lived his life on earth. There's three things that stand out for me. He spent time with his father. He spent time with his disciples. And he spent time with the people. But always, always he spent time with his father. So on my own journey, this has become my desire. Whenever it's not a real journey, it's my desire to journey like that. Time with the father. Time with you, my community and time with the people and the needs out there. But foremost, foremost, time with the Father. Over the past 10 years, as I was embracing my own story, I started to really value my personal experience with the living word of God. Now at Fountain, not only do we believe in the great commandment, and the Great Commission. We also believe in the Great Invitation. Everyone gets to play. And what a privilege it is to be part of a community where there is such a culture. And sometimes it's, it's said in jest, but there's so much value in that. My own story 
would not have developed the way to the degree it has been if it wasn't for the invitation, come and play, just as you are. I often tell the story when the first time when Dave um, invited me to become part of the leadership. We had a meeting at my house and I said, Dave, I want to share with you because I don't think I'm cut out to be the leader and these are the reasons. And I've got a couple of issues that I differ with you, Dave, on theologically. And Dave just listened, didn't debate, didn't try to convince me of his opinion. He said this, he said, Voter, can we agree on one thing? Can we agree on Jesus? I said, Dave, we can agree on Jesus. He says, well, come on my leadership. So I want to say to you, don't delay. Don't delay it. Just start playing. Now, most Christians that I've encountered have this moment, this date that they refer to where they accepted Jesus in their heart. I don't have a date like that. I can remember when I was seven years old, I had this encounter with the Holy Spirit. It was very real to me. And then when I was il- turned 11, I got baptized. Now, those days, we had this big pond, this bath thing that we had to fill. I mean, it must have been probably close to 15,000 liters of water. I mean, it's unbelievable. 15,000 liters of water and three people get baptized. Anyway, that's the way we did it in those days. And I remember that night, I wanted to, I wanted to impress Letty Marie. It's this girl I liked. I thought if... if um, she sees I'm going to be baptized, I will get some points. I've realized one thing that, that evening, that God has got a sense of humor. God saw my heart, but he also um, saw the, that part of me that needs, to be, needs some working on. Anyway, Letty Marie never turned up for that evening service, but I got baptized, and God um, honored that, that childlike faith on the one side, and taught me a lesson on the other side. But I do have a date. I have a date of my midlife crisis. The 5th of February, 2005. And I've coined this phrase. You can use it as well. To me, it's not a midlife crisis, but it's a midlife Christ moment. Now, I strongly believe in the concept that there are two halves of your life. The first half and the second half. First half, first half is a lot about acquiring, and it's a natural process you acquire your wealth, you acquire your family, wisdom, knowledge, um, studies, your career. And then it comes a moment where you turn to your second half of your life and you, get, you can relinquish. And both of those things, your story is valuable. And I remember that night, on the 5th of February 2010, we were out with the church in the Karua, just below the Coxco Mountains. And as the people were worshipping, I thought, I cannot do this anymore. I've got to get out. So I walked out, went to sit under the stars. It's a beautiful evening in Karua. And I said to God, that's it. I'm throwing out everything. Everything that I've learned, everything that I've, over the years, that I've understand about church, I'm done with it. From now on, whatever I experience, whatever I do, will be something that I've personally experienced. And around that, I will continue Somehow I didn't bother God too much that I said it, because a week later, I believe my ministry started. A friend of mine who was going for a divorce came to see me in a state. And, and then I had an opportunity to walk with him. A journey for a couple of months that took us all the way to Van Staden's Bridge those days before the fencing was there. And it was such a surreal experience, but I believe God used me and if I think back now, just like God was saying that evening in a career, okay, voter, now you, you can do it. I'm quite happy. And that's how my, I believe my ministry started. I want to share with you just several things. In the last 10 years, seven things that I have learned from my own experience, going back to my experience on a career where I said that's the way I want to live. I want to share that with you. I know, seven things sounds like a lot of things. But the nice thing about the social media is you can put a pause button to it. You can actually go one day and, and listen to the first one, and it can take you seven days. But please, do listen to those seven truths, which, are, which 
the truths that I um, adhere to, not because it's mine, but because I prayed before the time. And I say, God, when I speak, may you, the people, hear what you want them to hear. May they only hear that what you want to share with them. So truth number one for me is this. I'm totally convinced about Jesus. I'm convinced that Jesus came to this earth, that he became fully human, yet he was fully God. And he showed us the way back to the Father. His way is always better, and it's a better way of living now. We often talk about living in a now. And I'm also very much aware that for some of you, the now is a very painful place. For some of you, the now means unemployment or sickness. For some of you, the now means a divorce or separation, a death of a loved one. And those are real things. So for you, now is not a better way. And I don't understand always suffering and pain. But maybe when the now is too much to bear, then we have the hope, the hope of a better tomorrow. But overall, taking all of that in consideration, I believe Jesus is who he says he is. The second truth is this. God is a good father. Now the Holy Scriptures are full of people that experience this, the goodness of God as a father. You might have your own special scriptures. To me, I've got two scriptures. One is the 28th of May 2005, and the other one is the 14th of May 2010. And those two dates were the dates when my children, when I met my children for the first time. I remember the day that I was sitting on the floor in the hospital and my son cried his first cry as he was born, being born. Um, and at that moment, something happened. I fell in love with someone I've never seen. And then when I met my daughter five years later, and she was then two months old, and when I picked her up the first time, I knew she was my daughter, and I started to chat with her, and something happened, an experience. And if I, as a human being, can fall in love with children like that instantly, children that I didn't even know existed a couple of days before, how much more Father, the God that actually is called the perfect Father. God is a good Father. The third truth that I've learned over this 10 years is God speaks to us all the time. All the time. It's just my inability to hear Him that is the problem. And when I started this discipleship group that we do with Dion Lewis, it was my prayer and, I, and the goal that I would learn to hear God. And over the past two and a half years, it's starting to happen where I just this drop. I don't hear this audible voice, but there's this drop in my, in my insight. And I can start to confidently feel that God, that I'm hearing when God is speaking. And then God speaks to us through nature. He speaks for us through other people. He speaks for us through the Holy Scriptures, and he speaks to us through his living word. The fourth truth that I've embraced is this, the value of knowing yourself. Now, David Benner um, wrote the book, The Gift of Knowing Yourself, and he made this radical statement. He says, you cannot know God unless you know yourself, and you cannot know yourself unless you know God. And that no is more than knowledge. Now, my friend Rory, who I meet on a, on a Sunday morning, spoke to me last week about this no in the Hebrew. Now, in the Greek, knowing is more about knowledge, but the Hebrew is about a relationship. It's much more than, than knowing as a knowledge, but it's having a relationship. We often talk about us dropping a mask, and, and, our, and our church and I really believe it is a place where we can be free to drop that mask. But lately, I've, 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 there's another word I'm trying to use instead of a mask, and it's called a persona, because a mask is almost a deliberate thing. You put on something to confuse people or to deliberately um, hide something. Persona is more like a, a place, a, a, a way of living, which is not right, which is linked to the false self, but it is there. And it is Richard Raw speaks about, about this, 
how to get rid of your mask or this persona. He talks about your essence. If, that, if the true self is the middle, the essence, around that is the space that he calls the area of avoidance. It's the pain, the places you don't want to go, the p- things you want to hide. And then to hide that, you create this persona. But the persona is your false self. And then you obviously carry a mask to hide that. And he says the way to get rid of your mask is to turn towards your area of avoidance and move towards And as you move to that essence, that center, your mask will disappear. And for me, that's been a great privilege to, to, to walk that road of mask dropping. And then this is the thing. When you start knowing yourself, you can then trust your heart. Hebrews 10 verse 16 says this, I will put my laws in your heart. I will write them in their minds. So if God trusts my heart and he trusts my mind with his law, then I can start trusting my heart as well. There's a freedom in that. Yet it brings me to my next truth. Stay humble and stay grounded. My story is but a part. It's not the beginning. It's not the end. That phrase belongs to God. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. Paul says this, and obviously everyone knows this this little thing what Paul said. He says, we see in part and we know in part. The part that I know might not be the part that you know. I see the God as this multifaceted, and I see a part. And that part is enough for me to sustain me on this earth. And your part might be a slightly different angle, and it's fine. I must constantly watch myself for arrogance, on the other side, false humility. And even as, if, as a, while I was preparing for this message, it was again the same thing. On the one side, I want to downplay the value of my message. I'm not a real preacher. I don't know the scriptures well. So my message is not as good as others. And on the other side, I want to prepare really well and do a great job so you like me. And the Holy Spirit, the gentle Holy Spirit that he is, just say, Voter, what is the common denominator in those little, those little arguments of you? It is me. It's I. It's all about you. Let me discuss that. It's not about me. It's about you. It's about me. And I said, yes, Father God. I apologize. And so often I need to read this psalm for myself, Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts and see if there is an offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I need to read that and pray that so often. Truth number six, nothing goes to waste. Romans 8 verse 28 says this, We know that in all things God works for the good with those who love him. In all things. Do not believe the lie that you are not worth it. Do not believe the lie that you've blown it so many times that your story cannot have true value. I want to tell you my compost story. Now, I went back, and the last time I told the story was in 2018. So I'm very glad there's a lot of newcomers here, so you'll appreciate my story. For those who have listened to my compost story many times, my apologies. In our kitchen, there is a counter, and there's a hole, and it's a bucket. And every day, we fill that with organic matter. May it be peelings, vegetables, rotten um, fruit and veggies, eggshells, coffee, granules, tea bags. goes in there. And if it stays there for a while, starting to smell, the mughis will get there. And it's got very little value while it's there. And then I've got this place in my garden. It's my compost contraption. I've got an earthworm farm. And we take that and we move it to the earthworms and we give it to them. And a couple of days later, you go there, you open up, and there's a smell. There's a smell of earth. There's a smell of life. And that waste that was in the kitchen is now being transformed but that's not the end of the story. From there it will move 
to the garden, to the veggie garden, to any other plants, and it gives nutrients to that plant. Now you can see where I'm going to with this. Everything that happens in your life, things that happen because of your own mistakes, your own regrets, things that happen to you, all things, God works for the good. But while those things are in your kitchen, it's got the potential, it's got the value. It comes from life. The peelings, the veggies, all come from a life. But right there, the value is not there. It's got to move to the holy earthworms. And the holy earthworms will work it and do that what they do best and change that into compost. And then that compost, which is your story, can be used. And other people will, will grow from it. Other people will be encouraged by your story. Rob L says this, that the, um, oh, what did he say? Um, we'll leave that one. Truth number seven is freedom and truth. So the, the themes of the past year, um, preaching themes was exactly this, freedom and truth. And when we hear those two words, when you hear it, it will mean something to you. Something will come up in you and you understand what it means for you. And maybe the way I think about freedom and about truth is a little bit different maybe what you think. But it's okay, I think. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he also said this, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Another translation says, the truth shall set you free. I really like the first translation, make you free. It's like there's a process. Set means it's like an instant, instant thing. But make you free is a process. And again, when he says you shall know the truth, refer to back to knowing mean having a relationship with him. And this making of making free refers to me is that this transformation that we, that we busy, this process of transformation. And for me, the, this process of spiritual transformation didn't come as a result of, the, of sin. I think it was always God's plan for us to be transformed. Adam and Eve were deceived. They were told they can instantly be like God. But through tr transformation, we can become like him. We can become love. And finally, and I'm coming in for my landing. Okay, that was very original. I'm starting to understand that there's nothing I can do to earn this, to make it happen, to transform myself. Now, this is not a truth yet. I'm working on this one. Hopefully, if I preach in a year's time, I'll have eight truths, and that will be my next one. So that I can only surrender. The ultimate expression of my freedom is to surrender my freedom. At the beginning of this year, in 2020, I started with this goal. This is another book that Dave Benner wrote, um, To Surrender to Love. And I said, God, this is what I want to do. 2020, I want to surrender. And my year started crazy. The last three months has been just absolutely crazy. And I had so many opportunities to practice this. We had to surrender. And then I surrender and I pick up again. And I just imagine God says, there he goes again. And gently he waits. He knows I will come back. And I was practicing the surrender, picking up, surrender. And then sometimes I get it right. And then it's a great day. That day when I'm able to go through the day in that space, in that of surrendering. But I've learned one thing. If you want to surrender to love, you need to surrender from something. And in my life, that surrender from something is fear. And I had to constantly, on a daily basis, learn how to let go of my fear in order to surrender to love. And it's amazing. When I get it right, it's great. When I don't, God is just waiting for me to reset and work through it. So if your heart is beating, 
then you have a story to tell. And if you believe that you're valuable to God, then you must also believe that your story is valuable to God. And therefore, you too should value your true story. Let's pray. I wrote this prayer down, so I want to read it to you. Father God, I want to declare this morning that it's all about you. It's about your name. It's about your kingdom. It's about your will. We seldom get it right, but we will not give up. May we surrender to your love again. May we pursue quality alone time with you again. May we continue to learn the art of hearing you well. And then we can go out and spend time living our story. And God, if we need to tell our story as well, may your story always be the center of our story. Thank you. Amen.